subcommittee on intergovernmental affairs will come to order without objection the chair is authorized to declare a recess at any time uh, i will begin with my opening statement um, to determine what the american people value in society you might start by following the money transferred from the federal government to the public uh, to this end the subcommittee is holding this hearing to examine the management of federal grant awards since the earliest days of the Republic, the federal government has used grants to advance public policy from veterans assistance uh, in the aftermath of the War of 1812 to land grants for railroads after the Civil War. Federal grants have been part of our nation's history for a long time. Today, the federal government awards over $700 billion in grants annually. $700 billion. Federal grants finance essential government programs like infrastructure by transferring federal dollars to state and local governments, nonprofits, and individuals. However, different standards and reporting requirements scattered across federal programs impose a high cost. Federal grant managers spend 40% of their time monitoring compliance rather than monitoring results. According to a report by the Data Foundation, grant recipients are also burdened by the complexity of federal grants. Grantees are required to submit duplicative reports and forms to multiple program officers spread across multiple agencies. Congress and the executive branch have made several attempts to improve grant management and transparency. In 2014, Congress passed the Data Act. The Data Act was intended to standardize federal spending data, improve accuracy and usability of the data, make federal spending data, and make federal spending data accessible to the public online. Section 5 of the Data Act created a pilot program to explore standardizing recipient reporting to reduce burdens on awardees and improve the usability of the reported data. Section 5 pilot wrapped up last year. The final report offered three recommendations. Continue to standardize data, leverage technology, <coughs> excuse me, leverage technology to reduce compliance burdens by auto-populating forms with previously provided data and leverage open standards to rapidly develop new tools. My colleagues, Dr. Virginia Fox from North Carolina and Congressman Jimmy Gomez from California, agreed with these recommendations. They introduced bipartisan legislation, the Grant Reform Efficiency and Agreements Transparency Act, or the GRADE Act, to codify the pilot uh, report's recommendations. The GRADE Act would require HHS and OMB to create data standards for grant recipient reporting and require federal grant-making agencies to use those standards. The President's management agenda also calls for an integrated data-centric strategy to standardize grant reporting and reduce compliance burdens. In addition to reducing waste and burdens from unnecessary compliance exercises, modernizing grant data will improve accountability at grant-making agencies. Annually, the federal government loses track of millions of dollars due to a failure to review and reconcile grantee reports in a timely manner. In 2016, uh, the GAO found nearly $1 billion in expired grants with undisbursed balances in over 8,000 accounts contained in the HH payment management system. To address this problem, Congress passed the Grants Oversight New Efficiency Act, or GONE Act. Among other things, the GONE Act required agencies to report to Congress explaining today delays in closing out certain grant awards that were past their performance end date. The first report was sent to, to the committee in May. According to the report, one of the primary explanations for delayed closeout and expired grants cited by federal agencies was disconnected IT systems for managing grants and for paying grants. Without a modern technological framework, we cannot expect agencies will improve their ability to track the administration of federal grant awards. It is my hope that this Congress can continue to help in this effort with continued oversight of the grant making process. Fortunately, we have with us today a panel that can speak to the role Congress can play in reforming and modernizing the grant management process. I thank the witnesses for being here. I now recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Raskin, for his opening statement. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much, and thanks for those uh, thoughtful opening remarks. Thanks also to the witnesses for coming to testify today on this uh, important subject. Um, uh, alas, um, I, I disagree with a lot of what is taking place right now um, with the administration. And I want to say that President Trump has uh, eliminated or undermined a host of federal programs and grant making processes that he disagrees with. And um, this is a complete misunderstanding of his role as president. 
um, as president, his job is to take care that the laws are faithfully executed, even if he disagrees with the laws. And if he doesn't like our laws, he doesn't like our programs, he can try to convince Congress to change them. He's got that uh, authority and power. Or he can run for Congress himself, but he can't just unilaterally decide to stop implementing our laws and our programs. And this is the kind of sabotage he engaged in when his agents at the Department of Health and Human Services eliminated the teen pregnancy prevention program, which has helped to significantly lower the nation's teen pregnancy rate, bringing it down to uh, it's all-time low, I believe. This program has bipartisan support in Congress. It's trained more than 7,000 health professionals and supported more than 3,000 community-based groups that serve millions of young people in America. So the decision to kill the teen pregnancy prevention program was so lawless and so extreme that a federal judge reversed HHS's action, writing, and I quote, <clears throat> HHS's failure to articulate any explanation for its action, much less a reasoned explanation, exemplifies arbitrary and capricious agency action meriting reversal. And that's what the court did. The administration has also acted by way of godfather-style offers, too. It has illegally threatened to hold hostage federal grant funds for public safety in order to coerce local governments into support of its anti-immigrant policies. Judges blocked that one, too. In April, a three-judge panel of all Republican appointees, I should add, ruled that the administration exceeded its legal authority by imposing conditions that Congress simply had never authorized. The judges wrote, and I quote, the attorney general in this case used the sword of federal funding to conscript state and local authorities to aid in federal civil immigration enforcement. But the power of the purse rests with Congress, the court wrote which authorized the federal funds at issue and did not impose any immigration enforcement conditions on the receipt of such federal funds. The Trump administration has also destroyed best grant making practices employed to ensure that grant recipients use federal funds as Congress intended. In June, OMB disbanded the Council on Financial Assistance Reform, an interagency group that was created under the Obama administration specifically to improve federal grant making practices. OMB also directed agencies to stop reporting key metrics and remove mandatory quarterly progress reporting. I thought the president promised to run the government like a business, but I didn't realize he meant a business like Trump University or Trump Mortgage or Trump Stakes or the various now defunct casinos that used his name. If you're going to run the government like a business, let's make it a good business, a solvent business, not a bankrupt entity which has been looted by its owner. I don't see a lot of faithful execution of the laws. I see an administration intent on picking winners and losers in federal grant making based on ideology. The American people deserve better than this highly politicized process. The American people deserve to know how billions of their dollars are being managed and how the federal government is monitoring the effectiveness of grant programs. Just two days ago, the GAO reported that only 15% of federal agencies met their IG standards for completeness, timeless, and accuracy under the Digital Accountability and Transparency Act, the Data Act, the 2014 law that aims to make information on federal expenditures accessible and transparent. Again, that means 85% of our agencies failed to meet the standards because of the tone that has been set at the top. And that has obvious results in terms of transparency and accuracy. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for calling this, this hearing because there are some really important problems that we, we need to deal with. And I think the administration has done a disservice to Americans with the policies it has engaged in undermining federal programs and federal laws. And we should be able to work together in a bipartisan way in Congress to get back on track and to restore the coherence of legislative uh, dictates. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce our witnesses. Uh, Mr. Hudson Hollister, Executive Director of Data Coalition. Uh, Ms. Michelle S uh, Sager, uh, Director of Strategic Issues at the U.S. Government Accountability Office. Ms. Andrea uh, L. Brandon, Deputy Sec Assistant Secretary of the Office of Grants and Acquisition Policy and Accountability at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Mr. Peter Tyler, Senior Policy Analyst at the Project on Government Oversight. And Ms. Natalie Keegan, Analyst of the American Federal Federalism and Emergency Management at the Congressional Research Service. 
Welcome to you all. Pursuant to committee rules, all witnesses will be sworn in before you testify. Please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Uh, the record will reflect that the witness answered in the affirmative. Please be seated. In order to allow time for discussion, please limit your testimony to five minutes. Your written uh, statement, your entire written statement, will be made part of the record. As a reminder, the clock in front of you shows uh, your remaining time. The light will turn yellow when you have 30 seconds left and red when your time is up. Uh, please also remember to press the button to turn your microphone on before speaking. Uh, I now recognize uh, Mr. Hollister for his um, testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Palmer, Ranking Member Raskin, thank you for inviting me to testify today. If the federal grant system were a business, as Mr. Raskin has suggested, it would be the world's largest, with almost 50% more revenue than Walmart. The overwhelming majority of these funds goes to state and local governments, uh, both directly and through sub-grants issued by state agencies. And this whole enormous system is managed through a complex array of reporting requirements. The reporting requirements are spread across thousands of different grant program offices. Here's our challenge. Grant reporting is a document-based affair. Grantees fill out forms and submit those forms to grantor agencies. Some agencies have implemented grant management systems that collect these forms through electronic uploads. But even in those systems, the forms are still PDF documents. They are electronic versions of the paper that they replaced. Document-based reporting presents two basic problems. First, it does a very poor job of delivering transparency to agencies, to Congress, to taxpayers. There is no central repository of all the information that grantees report to grantor agencies, nor is there any feasible way to create one. Second, grantees sustain unacceptable compliance costs in both time and money. Grantees must manually fill out the reporting forms, often providing the same information multiple times. Document-based reporting prevents both the grantees and the grantors from tracking and comparing performance or from making data-driven decisions. Here's our solution. By replacing document-based forms with standardized data, the federal government can resolve both problems. First, standardized data will allow transparency, easy comparisons across programs and across government, and second, standardized data will allow grantees to compile and submit their information automatically and more cheaply. Now, this is not the same thing as creating a single government-wide system or a single government-wide reporting portal. If we were to replace document-based forms with standardized data, the agencies and the program offices could still operate separate grant management systems if they so chose. But by adopting common data structures and formats, we can allow information to easily be pulled from all of those systems automatically and easily aggregated for agency-wide and even government-wide transparency. Now, a transformation from document-based reporting to data-centric reporting requires three steps. First, the White House, working with grantor agencies and grantees, must define the data elements that are most commonly used in all these forms. Second, the White House must make this list of data fields or taxonomy mandatory for all grant programs. Third, all the grantor agencies must begin collecting grant reports as data instead of as documents. In early 2018, this committee and the administration both took major steps toward that transformation. First, on February 6, 2018, this committee favorably reported the Grant Reporting Efficiency and Agreements Transparency Act, or GREAT Act, which will require exactly the three steps I mentioned. Dr. Fox and Mr. Gomez deserve credit for championing this critical reform. And second, on March 20th, as part of the President's management agenda, the White House announced a cross-agency priority goal or CAP goal on results-oriented accountability for grants. Under that goal, the White House has committed to creating a taxonomy 
of the data elements that are most commonly used in grant reports with a deadline of the end of this fiscal year. Now that's the first of the necessary three steps. We eagerly await the publication of that data taxonomy. Now the Data Coalition represents 46 data companies all working together to make our government more efficient and transparent. Our company's solutions can deliver transparency and can automate grantee reporting, but only if the federal government undergoes this basic transformation from document-based to data-centric. I'm also the president of the Data Foundation. Last month, the Data Foundation issued our most recent report on transforming federal grant reporting, explaining that federal leaders are ready for this transition. Federal leaders are ready for the GREAT Act and for the realization of the CAP goal. Thank you, and I look forward to the subcommittee's questions. Chair now recognizes Ms. Sager for her testimony. Chairman Palmer, Ranking Member Raskin, and Dr. Fox, thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this very important hearing on federal grants management. As we have all heard, federal grants are an important tool of government representing hundreds of billions of dollars in federal expenditures every year. They also vary in many ways, including how federal agencies implement them, their size, the nature of their recipients, and the types of programs that they fund, everything from transportation to disaster assistance to child nutrition, and the list goes on and on. This diversity and complexity contributes to the challenge of any efforts to make cross-cutting grants management reform across the government. GAO has done a number of reports on federal grants management spanning several decades. My, my oral statement today will focus on two key points. First, observations on longstanding grants management challenges, and second, opportunities to address these challenges through some of the current grant modernization initiatives. First, GAO's body of work on federal grants has identified a number of cross-cutting challenges, including streamlining, transparency, collaboration and consultation, overlap and duplication, and oversight. A couple of key examples illustrate these challenges. These examples are highlighted in my written statement and, of course, the underlying GAO reports provide additional detail. First, as we've heard about, in terms of transparency, the Data Act required agencies to increase the type of information that is available in a public way. Agencies have made great progress in providing standardized information and making that publicly available. But as GAO has reported a couple of times now, there is still additional progress that needs to continue, particularly with regard to data quality. Second, with regard to duplication and overlap, we have made a number of recommendations to agencies aimed at refining their grant management practices to check for duplication before they actually make grant awards. In response to these recommendations, agencies have taken action and they are now checking for duplication. GAO's work has also identified weaknesses related to grants oversight and internal controls in a number of areas. For example, as we've already heard, we identified opportunities for agencies to more consistently close out grants when the grantee period of performance has ended. The GONE Act passed Congress, and we are grateful for that act, and we now are looking forward to following what agencies are doing in response to the GONE Act as they are taking action to close out their expired grant accounts. As we go forward, the current grant management initiatives present opportunities to address these challenges. As the current administration looks at the CAP goal that we just heard about, results-oriented accountability for grants, this goal needs to be integrated with other ongoing government-wide initiatives, for example, with data implementation, as well as with other initiatives related to evidence-based policy. We have made a number of recommendations about cross-cutting government-wide initiatives and focused on a couple of fe key features that those initiatives need to represent. So for example, in any government-wide cross-cutting initiative, you need to have a clear sense of what your goals are and then follow up to make sure that those goals are in progress. You also need to have clear roles and responsibilities and have a sense of who's doing what. And finally, you also need to have clear communication that is two-way with the stakeholders involved in any of these initiatives. 
as the cap goal for grants goes forward, it's very important that it relates to these other government-wide initiatives and that it is an integrated approach to make sure that these initiatives work together. Otherwise, you run the risk of these initiatives operating in silos or even working at cross purposes. We have ongoing work related to the implementation of the CAP goals as well as implementation of the Data Act and the infusion of evidence-based policy across the federal government, including in federal grants. In conclusion, as we move forward, part of the challenge of any government-wide initiative is designing and implementing grants management policy that maintains accountability on the one hand, but at the same time is attuned to the potential administrative burden for grantors, agencies, and grantees. Meeting this challenge requires intergovernmental collaboration across the federal government, intergovernmental collaboration with state and local governments and other partners, as well as the integration that I made reference to with other ongoing initiatives. This concludes my prepared remarks, and I look forward to any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you. The chair recognizes Ms. Brandon for her testimony. Chairman Palmer, Ranking Member Raskin, and Dr. Fox, Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you to discuss the Department of Health and Human Services grants, policies, and practices. In particular, the standardization and transparency of grant reporting, HHS's role in the President's Management Agenda Cross-Agency Priority Goal, CAP Goal 8, and the HHS results of grant closeouts and undisbursed balances as required by the Grants Oversight and New Efficiency Act, also known as the GON Act. As the Deputy Assistant Secretary for HHS's Grants and Acquisition Policy and Accountability Office, I serve as the Department's lead executive responsible for the management, administration, and oversight of HHS's grants and acquisition programs. HHS is the federal government's largest grant-making organization, awarding approximately $500 billion in discretionary grants annually. Last year, HHS kicked off the Reimagine HHS transformation, which was prompted by OMB Memorandum M-17-22. HHS has taken this as an opportunity to re-examine and improve how we deliver on our mission. Grants management was identified as one of 10 priority initiatives under Reimagine HHS, and reInvent Grants Management was formed to identify and implement improvements to the grants management processes. HHS plans to improve or reinvent the grant notice of award, the federal financial report, grants management training and certification, and the grants management information technology business systems. Further, HHS plans to standardize data elements, eliminate forms while creating structured data sets, and provide a single sign-on capability for our public-facing systems. HHS is also looking at the newest technology in artificial intelligence, process robotics, and blockchain for reinventing how we do grant business at HHS. The Digital Accountability and Transparency Act of 2014 expanded the Federal Funding Accountability and Transparency Act of 2006 to increase accountability and transparency in federal spending, making federal expenditure information more accessible to the public. HHS was pleased to have led the grants work done under Section 5 of the Data Act, and HHS believes strongly in furthering the Data Act Section 5 grants pilot efforts under its Reimagine initiative. The PMA CAP Goal 8 challenges federal agencies to maximize the value of grant funding by applying a risk-based data-driven framework that balances compliance requir requirements with demonstrating successful results. The strategy is three-pronged. Number one, standardize the grant data. Number two, leverage existing data sources and processes. And three, develop a risk-based framework for performance management. OMB has initiated three government-wide working groups in order to formalize the development and implementation of this CAP goal. HHS is vested in providing guidance and leadership for the CAP 8 goal as our deputy CFO is designated co-leader of the goal and several HHS staff are currently leading several of those work groups. HHS will coordinate our internal efforts via reInvent Grants Management to coordinate with the PMA CAP Goal 8. The GON Act was signed into law on January 28, 2016, with the aim to facilitate the closing of expired grants. HHS, via our GON Act compliance activities, found two primary challenges leading to delays in closing out grants and cooperative agreements in the HHS payment management system. Number one was policy, and number two was system issues. 
Under policy, reconciliation issues led to a large number of expired grants with small undisbursed balances remaining open. Under system issues, the management of pooled accounts in PMS also affected the timeliness of grant closeouts. HHS has implemented several measures to reduce the number of open but expired awards. Operation Clean Sweep resulted in the closure of over 30,000 federal awards across HHS. And the GON Act monthly reporting initiative resulted in an additional 17,000 grants being closed. The resolution of the remaining award balances involving number of business functions such as grants policy, financial policy, and IT systems. Therefore, we have convened a multidisciplinary work group to develop and implement strategies for closing these accounts and preventing future issues. In conclusion, HHS strongly agrees with the need to protect taxpayers' dollars and is committed to using its reInvent Grants Management Initiative to standardize and or eliminate duplicative processes in order to serve as careful stewards of these funds. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I'm glad to answer any questions. I thank the witness. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Tyler uh, for his testimony. Chairman. Chairman Palmer, Ranking Member Raskin, and Dr. Fox, I appreciate the opportunity to testify before the subcommittee about grant management improvement. This is a critical topic of government reform, and successful efforts would result in better accountability of federal grants and more effective use of grant money. I am a senior policy analyst for the Project on Government Oversight, or POGO, where I focus my efforts on a range of government accountability initiatives. Founded in 1981, uh, we are a nonpartisan independent watchdog that champions good government reforms. The subcommittee has my written testimony, so I would like to highlight just a couple of points at this time. First, Congress has an important role in helping the administration and agencies to move forward with the President's Management Agenda goal on federal grant reform. This laudable initiative will need much more specific plans to achieve its goals. Second, there are many lessons to be learned from the recent successes and challenges of the Digital Accountability and Transparency Act, the Data Act, implementation that are directly applicable to grant management reform. The President's Management Agenda, released earlier this year, correctly included grants management as a major goal and outlining the challenges and strategies for improvement. Currently, federal agencies simply do not perform adequate levels of oversight and are too often unable to detect problematic or even fraudulent grants. Further, each federal agency or even each federal program can have its own process and standards for awarding and managing grants. The President's agenda proposes several solutions, one of which is to standardize grant reporting data, especially financial data. This could lead to improved grant evaluations and increase the understanding of performance. However, success will depend on the thoughtful development and implementation of specific and well-defined steps. The President's management agenda need, needs further articulation and all the milestone dates must be set. Currently, for example, the administration's public document outlining implementation steps has four milestones for data standardization. The first milestone was completed in 2017. The next two are due by the end of the current fiscal year. Unfortunately, the final and most important data standardization goal lacks specificity or even a time frame for completion. The administration must create specific plans for data standardization and other key implementation goals. This should include more detailed impl implementation steps, reporting procedures for agencies, and quarterly milestones over multiple years. Further, these steps should be developed in a transparent manner with the input of stakeholder and civil society groups. Will implementation of the administration's grant management reforms prove successful? Perhaps. The recent history of a related federal data transparency plan offers important lessons. The Data Act, enacted in 2014 with the strong support and work of this committee, has the goal of significantly improving the quality and scope of government spending data made available to the public. Treasury and the Office of Management and Budget smartly engaged in a collaborative and transparent process. They established a multi-agency working group and involved outside stakeholders, which successfully identified potential pitfalls well before committing to an approach. POGO recommends that grant management follow a similar approach, especially including stakeholder and civil society dialogue and input. The federal government spends about $2.5 trillion annually through grants, contracts, direct assistance, loans, insurance, and other financial awards. 
while each type of spending might need specialized requirements, we should ideally move forward with improvements in all of these major fiscal vehicles at the same time rather than breaking them apart and addressing them only one at a time. For example, the administration and Congress should work together to curb improper payments in grants and other types of spending. Federal spending through government contracts also pose ongoing challenges for accuracy and transparency. In conclusion, the coming years could see great progress. These efforts should include increased specificity in the President's Federal Grant Reform Initiative, learning from the successes and challenges of the Data Act implementation, as well as ongoing implementation of the Data Act, and finally, pursuing other federal spending reform initiatives, such as new improper payments legislation and oversight of federal contracting. Thank you once again for the opportunity to provide our testimony to the subcommittee, and I look forward to your questions. This has been a, a great panel of witnesses so far. Everybody's finished early. So <laughs> it puts a huge burden on the next witness, Ms. Keegan. We look forward to your five-minute testimony. Chairman Palmer, Ranking Member Raskin, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the invitation to testify. As requested, my testimony focuses on a selection of issues relating to grant modernization priorities outlined in the President's management agenda and standardizing federal grant reporting and transparency. The written statement goes into more detail, but I will touch upon the key points. First, it may be helpful to provide some context. While Congress enacts legislation authorizing grant programs and providing funding, grant recipients must apply for the funds and federal agencies establish policies and procedures to award and manage those funds. Congress is therefore directing grant funding towards policies, but federal agencies and grant recipients play a key role in how federal grants are distributed and managed. In constant dollar terms, federal grant funding has grown substantially over the last 75 years, from about the equivalent of $17 billion in 1942 to over $674 billion in FY 2017. OMB provides overall guidance to federal agencies for grant management, and federal agencies may choose how to promulgate that guidance into regulations for individual grant programs, which may result in inconsistencies across federal agencies. The President's management agenda discusses IT modernization, data accountability and transparency, and the workforce. When assessing these topics in terms of federal grant management, one of the emerging themes is how silos in grant management have created challenges to effective and efficient program management. Generally, federal agencies separate grant management functions into three categories, financial management, program management, and grant oversight. These functions are usually assigned to different parts of the agency, with the financial management done by the chief financial officer shop, program management by the program shop, and grant oversight by the agency inspector general. Financial management includes, among other things, reporting award information and dispersing funds. Program management involves reviewing and processing grant applications and approving changes in the scope of work and grant oversight includes investigating allegations of waste, fraud, and abuse. Although some functions are shared, there is often limited communication between grant management components, which can impede effective grant management and limit oversight. There are also silos within each grant management function. This, this is particularly true in the context of IT modernization. For example, the financial management function of federal agencies often contains multiple cash management systems within a single agency, and these systems may not be interoperable. The program management function has separate grant management databases, and like cash management systems, there may be multiple grant management databases within a single agency. Additionally, the cash management systems and the grant management systems are not interoperable. Both types of systems contain information that informs program evaluation, but evaluating a grant program would require drawing from multiple databases across multiple federal agencies. Grant data transparency is also hindered by silos due to different types of data, such as financial data and performance data. These silos exist in part because of the division of grant management functions between financial managers and program managers. 
Because of the silos of grant management functions, it is difficult to define who comprises the grant management workforce, which may explain why there's no mandatory training requirements. As a result, federal agencies establish their own grant management training, which may lead to variation in job skills of grant management personnel across the government. Consequently, standardizing federal grant reporting faces challenges. When evaluating options, Congress may wish to consider the following questions. Can federal acquisition regulation inform the development of government-wide grant management regulations? If so, what are the potential limitations and benefits of using federal acquisition regulation as a model for grant regulation? What are the current limitations on evaluating grant management practices across federal agencies and among federal grant recipients? What challenges are facing federal agencies and grant recipients in implementing current grant management standardization and transparency measures, such as the Data Act and the GON Act? How would federal agencies and grantees prioritize standardization and transparency requirements should additional standardization measures be enacted? While federal grant management faces challenges on many fronts, greater transparency can improve ways to overcome those challenges and improve Congress's ability to exercise oversight. This concludes my statement. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I thank the witnesses for the testimony. The chair now recognizes uh, Dr. Fox for her questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I thank our witnesses for being here today. Um, you know people uh, who, there are very few people who get excited about this issue. <laughs> it is, <laughs> talking about data and standardization is not something that is going to uh, bring smiles to a lot of people's faces, but it brings, smile to my, brings a smile to my face to hear you all talking about this. And um, if the people involved with applying for grants and reporting on grants knew a little bit more about it, they'd be smiling too. So thank you all very much for being here. Um, I've actually been a grant writer for a long, long time. I go back, way back, and um, have actually dealt with the kinds of issues you're talking about. Uh, Mr. Hollister, uh, the, the federal government tends to impose policy on grant government, uh, state governments, excuse me, by assigning conditions to grants that it awards. As we work to modernize grant management, how can we protect state sovereignty? Thank you, Dr. Fox, and thank you for championing the GREAT Act. Uh, I had the opportunity a few years ago to sit with the staff of then Governor Patrick of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and they told me that Governor Patrick, when Congress imposed uh, sequestration, wanted to figure out the cumulative impact of sequestration on Massachusetts could not do it because the grants are separately administered between each grantor agency and the corresponding grantee agency of the state. There was no way to understand the full picture of grant funding for Massachusetts. In order to try to address that, 11 states and Puerto Rico have set up grants offices that seek to get a handle on the entire picture of all of the grants that the state is receiving. However, this is still almost prohibitively difficult because of the multiplicity of the reporting requirements. If your GREAT Act were enacted, and if we had a common data structure for all those forms, it would be simple for a governor's office or a grants office to understand the full picture of all grant funding being re received by the states. And as sovereign governments, the states could elect to comply in some places, perhaps refuse in others, while still maintaining all the requirements of the grants. Right. And, and you know, my feeling again about this legislation, it, it is a bipartisan piece of legislation. It is something that all of us who care about how money's being spent in the government should want to get done in a hurry. Um, so you've already talked about how the GREAT Act uh, builds off of the Data Act initiatives. Was there anything else you wanted to say in that area that you didn't get to say in your testimony because the time is so short? As a matter of fact, there is, Dr. Fox, and I thank you. Uh, some of the other witnesses have, have pointed out how the Data Act set up a single unified 
data set of all the information that federal agencies report on their spending. If your GREAT Act were enacted and implemented, we would also have a single unified data set of all the information that grantees are reporting. And because of the requirements in your bill, those two data sets would be interoperable. That means it would be possible to take a particular grant, see all of the aspects of congressional appropriations and individual payments coming from the agency, and also see what the grantee is saying about that grant. That means 360 degree transparency. Wow. Um, it Again, I, having more information can only be good, and having information that you can compare can only be good, in my opinion. Um, are there some other areas of grant reform that Congress should be aware of um, that are going on or that folks are thinking about? Uh, Dr. Fox, we do have some interesting stories from overseas of how other de developed countries have gone even farther, have set up a single portal uh, to which all of the information flows. There might be some savings there because it means the individual agencies no longer have to collect information themselves. Uh, however, that's not necessary to get to the transparency. What's really essential is that step of adopting the data standards. Great. Thank you. Ms. Brandon, have you had a chance to review the GREAT Act? And if you have, how do you think it relates to the Data Act pilot recommendations? Thank you, Dr. Fox, for that question. Um, yes, I have had the opportunity to re review the GREAT Act bill. And um, with regard to the way that we implemented the Data Act, we have 57 standard data elements that actually tie the financial management data elements for the agency in with the acquisition and grant data elements and the subaward uh, data elements. Uh, so we standardized all of those data elements across the financial acquisition and grants. Um, with regard to the GREAT Act, I think this is an awesome opportunity for us to continue to standardize those data elements across the entire life cycle of the grants management process. So everything from pre-award uh, aspects through the award, the monitoring, the audit resolution, and the cl closeout. And so definitely we are working currently within the President's Management Agenda Cap 8 goal on um, something called the uh, the Federal Integrated Business Framework Data Elements that we've already started pulling together. Um, we call it FIBIF for short. And it's 417 at the current point uh, where across the federal government we are working in a collaborative working group to look at those data elements across the entire grants management life cycle. So I think that that will actually tie in very nicely with the Data Act data elements that were created and we're looking forward to implementing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Grothman, for his questions. We'll start with Ms. Sager. Um, we're talking about grants that are, sh are should be closed out. Uh, what are some of the reasons that grants aren't closed out or in a timely manner at the end of the performance period? Thank you for the question. Thank you for the question. There are a number of reasons why grants may not be closed out in a timely manner, and we are delighted to see that they are now being tracked. So to just give you a couple of examples that repeat, appeared repeatedly in some of GAO's work, we did three reports on grant closeout, and some of the reasons that we heard uh, at one end of the spectrum, a grantee may no longer exist. That's making it very difficult to follow up and close out a grant. In other cases, you may have a grant system and a financial management system within an agency that need to be reconciled before the grant can be closed out. In other cases, you may have final deliverables that still need to come in before the final grant can be closed out. And still another example could be when you have multiple entities within an agency that are all contributing to the grant, all of them need to contribute to the final closeout. So all of those kinds of things are now being tracked, and we certainly would welcome additional requests to see where we are at this point in time now that the GONE Act has passed. Okay, how are we going to recapture the... Uh expired grants? So agencies, depending on the nature of their authorizing legislation, they may be able to redirect those funds. In other cases, those funds may be returned to the Treasury. Okay. Would GAO consider uh, another 
review of grant closeout issues? We absolutely would. We know that agency financial reports for 2017 are now in hand, and we soon will have another year in hand. That would then provide us with an opportunity to look at those two years and see the progress that we have made. And if there are opportunities to make additional recommendations, certainly we would look forward to working with this committee to do so. Okay, we'll move over to Ms. Brandon. Um, you're familiar with the Data Act? Is that for me? Did you say Ms. Brandon? Yes. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, yes, I am familiar with the Data Act. Um, what, what lessons have you learned so far uh, regarding standardized recipient reporting? Uh, with regard to the Data Act and standardized recipient reporting, we actually uh, had, a, had to take a look at the actual uh, business management data elements from the federal financial report that come in and actually work across our department to look at the standardization of how we implement those particular data elements and how we report out on those particular data, act, uh, data elements with regard to the Data Act. In addition to that, we actually had to look at uh, the reconciliation across the department with the financial data that came in from our financial systems, and we had to actually massage the data, if you will, to, to look at those anomalies, those uh, types of data anomalies that fell out as we coagulated all of the data together in order to report out on the Data Act. So we were able to look across our 11 operating divisions and staff div divisions and make sure that we had better quality data, and so it enabled us to help report in a more timely way and with the better data quality for the Data Act. Thanks. Does the, the huge number of data elements raise any concerns for HHS and other agencies? Uh, with regard to the data elements, the concerns actually had to do with uh, what we were using as standard data elements that were taken out of SAM.gov versus uh, other data elements that were required through the Data Act portal, uh, USAspending.gov, um, that were not in SAM.gov, and we weren't prepared for that, actually, so we had to make some very quick adjustments and some data mapping to ensure that we could meet the new requirements and that uh, we still would retain the quality of data necessary to report accurately. Okay. Once HHS identifies duplicative data elements, is there an effort to standardize or consolidate the forms? Actually, we're trying to get rid of the forms. <laughs> Uh, we would like to come up with a specific set of structured data elements um, across our entire department and actually have them reported in the system and not necessarily articulated or attached to a form per se. In addition to that, we are looking at having the recipients submit the information in in a structured data way and not have to be tied to actual forms. Um, and with the, uh, as we look at all of the forms that ha are currently in use, we're looking at the duplicate data elements and we are snapping them down to um, address only those data elements that are required and only necessary for reporting because we also did an analysis that uh, reflected we were collecting data elements that we actually never use and so we're going to strip those away um, but definitely we want to use our systems more and not and, and actually get away from forms okay well you you finished that right on the button so uh, thank you the chair recognizes my friend, the ranking member, uh, Mr. Raskin, for his questions. Thank you very much, Chairman Palmer. M Mr. Tyler, what was the Council on Financial Assistance Reform? Thank you, Congressman. That's an important question about this issue. There may be some people here at the table who could answer the question better, but in effect, COFAR was established to make sure that the then grant initiatives under the last administration would go forward in an effective way. Okay, but is there anybody else who wants to provide any insight on that? Um, I, I understand that, that the new director of the Office for Management and Budget disbanded the council, um, which was charged with trying to streamline and improve the, the policies. Can anybody tell me what was behind that decision? Does anybody know? Ms. Brandon, do you not know? I okay, um, um, but you know, and I, I understand. I'm a, hey, I'm a politician. I understand politicians like to create their own councils and commissions and get rid of the last persons. But was this replaced with something new that was tasked with trying to uh, improve the practices generally, Mr. Tyler? Do you know? Uh, 
this Congressman, that's a great question, and I actually have the same question. Uh, we definitely want to see moving forward on good reforms for the grant process. What I'm asking is the same question. I, I'm not 100% sure who's in charge. Recognizing the importance of health and human services work, uh, they are correctly taking a leadership role, but this is an interagency process. HHS, in effect, cannot tell Department of Commerce what to do with their grant program, and that's why having a council approach where people are brought to the table effectively and regularly is so important. I simply don't know who's convening those meetings. Okay, um, is that interagency process taking place to the knowledge of anybody on the panel? Does anyone know whether this Council on Financial Assistance Reform has been replaced with another interagency coordinating group? Um, I can actually tell you that the um, work that was done under the Council on Financial Assistance Reform has now been moved under the Chief Financial Officers Council at Office of Management and Budget. And while there is not a new committee that has been formed, the work is actually being addressed through that council. And that council actually has the co-lead on the new uh, cross-agency priority cap goal eight in the President's management agenda. So all of the grants uh, work and activity has been moved under the CFOC Council. Okay, great. Are you involved in that process? I am a sub-leader, if you will, under our Deputy CFO. Were you involved in the the COFAR, the Council on Financial in, in prior years, yes. You were? Yes. Okay. So, um, well, what, so what has been the effect of dissolving that council? Um, basically, we um, actually submit information to our Chief Financial Officer Council member, so that is our Deputy CFO at HHS, and we submit any type of grant reform um, considerations and initiatives that we would like to see from the grants perspective, and, it, and she ensures that it is put on the agenda uh, at the CFOC Council. And, and in addition to that, there is another committee that doesn't necessarily fall under the financial, um, under the Chief Financial Officers Council. It's called the Financial Assistance Committee on eGov, and it actually falls under the Acquisition Committee for eGov and the Integrated Acquisition Environment. And that is, um, that committee is made up of the 26 federal grant making agencies, and we do look at the uh, standardization of the grant data elements and the business processes and et cetera. Okay, let, let me stick with you then for a second. Um, w can you tell me about USAspending.gov's the website, USAspending.gov? Um, in particular? Well, it, it was created to try to build transparency, I think, into the yeah. process, but it was plagued with a whole host of problems when it first started. Is that um, right? it, it took. Uh, it was actually yeah. created in results of the Federal Financial uh, Assistance Transparency Act, the Transparency Act for short, and um, and I think that was in 2010. And basically, it was to produce the transparency in grant obligation and acquisition obligation data elements and the sub award uh, data elements. And um, while I think it did initially have issues, um, we actually were able to, um, I believe, overcome that and get probably about 90% of the data accurate uh, across the federal government prior to- But has there not been an attempt by this administration to upgrade it and change it that, that failed? It was upgraded during the Data Act implementation. I see, okay. Mr. Um, Raskin, I can speak to that if you wish. Please. I've done it when I was an oversight committee staffer here. Uh, That's the, great. The Data Act of 2014 dramatically expanded the website. Previously, the website only carried information about award spending. That's about one third of all federal spending, the stuff that goes out in grants or in contracts. I but see. there was no bigger picture. In 2014, Congress unanimously passed the Data Act, which required Treasury and OMB to work together to set these data standards for all the information and then publish one unified data set of everything, not just what goes out in grants and contracts, but all spending by the executive branch. The reporting for that spanned administrations. They didn't finish the project under the law until May of 2017, and that's when the reporting began. We now have that unified data set. Gotcha. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your patience, and I yield back to you. Thank you. Um, Chair, now I now recognize myself for a few questions. Um, uh, Mr. Tyler, in your um, testimony, in your written testimony, you said one example from the Department of Agriculture grant program is the school breakfast program. It should have records for approximately $4.5 billion in, in fiscal year 2017, but searches for this program return no records. And then you go on to point out that uh, Department of Transportation oversees the Federal Transit uh, Capital Investment Grants Program, which spent approximately $4.6 billion uh, in 2017, but USA spending records show only show 1.6 billion of that. That's less than half, as you pointed out. 
Uh, did you or your organization attempt to research this further? Uh, I, and, and, I, and, and, and what I'm trying to find out is, has there been any, uh, two things, has there been any um, effort to try to determine why uh, we don't have complete records and, and, and then after that, uh, what happened to the money? Mr. Chairman, your question goes to one of the key issues we're facing now with uh, this website and the Implementation of Data Act, uh, and also refers back to the question that Mr. Raskin asked. There is a lot of data missing and a lot of inaccurate data on the website, and this is a problem. Uh, the fact and, that and this is on, uh, on uh, uh, USA spending records or, or just across the board? On USA spending records I'm referring to, sir. Mm -hmm. That's correct. And we want to see more data. We want to see more complete data. data. We want to see more accurate data. The examples we gave in my testimony uh, showed some rather serious lacks there. The Government Accountability Office has also done some very good work detailing this. Uh, in fact, looking at a lot of reports of the various inspectors general. Without complete data, we simply do not have a complete picture. Progress is being made. Uh, one other aspect is making sure the data is accessible to the public and to Congress. We, as POGO, put together a letter, which a very long one, pointing out many ways of improving not only the data, but access to the data. And we think that it's an important thing to move forward. Its relevance to grants is twofold. First off, we want to make sure the grant data on USA spending is correct and complete. But secondly, as we move forward on grants reform, we should learn from some of the history of how to implement the Data Act. Let me, Mr. Hollister, you, um, in response to the question raised by the ranking member, Mr. Raskins, uh, seem to know a great deal about USA spending. Uh, what expectation should we have that the data that they have now uh, uh, is up to date and accurate and could could answer the question about the $4.5 billion in the, the breakfast program and, and the uh, $3 billion that is unaccounted for in the transportation? Uh, yes, sir. The, uh, the law currently requires every agency to report all of its spending using this common format to the USAspending.gov system, which is maintained by the Treasury Department. The responsibility belongs to the agencies, not to the Treasury. Of course, there are challenges in taking the world's largest and most complex organization, the US federal government, all of the disparate means of accounting that all those agencies use, all of the hundreds, thousands of different financial systems, putting all that information into one view. So there are some technical problems. Uh, however, if, if I could offer a suggestion, the fastest way for Congress to fix the quality of that data that's up there on that website for taxpayers is to appropriate based on it. Tell the agencies that if they don't report the spending to the USAspending.gov portal, you'll assume that's all that they got and you'll only provide, you only appropriate uh, that much more. I think you'll find a great deal of uh, improvement in the quality of Congress appropriates based on what's there. Well, that brings me back, uh, gets me to a point that I've been trying to make here for three years, seven months, and 22 days. That's how long I've been in Congress. And that is um, you generally get what you expect, define, and hold people accountable for. And that would apply to grant making. Uh, I think uh, it's incumbent on the federal government to, to make it very clear expectations on performance and, and cost, but at the same time for, for people who apply for grants that, that we do a good job of uh, evaluating the grant request uh, that should have clearly defined objectives that are measurable and, and that uh, we should be exercising oversight over to make sure that when we spend that money we get what we paid for. I don't think we do that and that's a problem across the board. Uh, I hope uh, uh, what we're doing now, and, and particularly with the, the legislation that's been introduced by Dr. Fox and Mr. Gomez, that we, we get uh, much, much closer uh, to that kind of, of accountability and oversight. Uh, Ms. Sager, uh, also in regard to, to the uh, breakfast program and the uh, Department of Agriculture and Department of Transportation, uh, is this something that GAO uh, would be able to answer? Uh, you know, the, where that money is. We, cer we certainly would be happy to assist in addition to broad grant management reform engagements. We also do a number of specific projects looking at individual grant programs or as individual aspects of grant programs. So we certainly would be happy to assist. And of course, accountability is our middle name at GAO. Mm -hmm. So we would be happy to help the committee. Well, GAO, GAO is one of my favorite uh, 
agencies in the federal government. I, I, I joke with people back home that a lot of people are, anticipate uh, the latest novel from their favorite author. I anticipate the latest <laughs> publication from GAO. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go a little over. We're going to do another round, so I, I'm, I'm going to exercise a little flexibility here uh, as chairman. Uh, I want to stay on this line about um, this USA um, uh, spending and, and GAO. Is there a, a working relationship between uh, you and USA spending? So that that uh, you're an exchange of information, uh, an ability to to cross cross reference. Absolutely, we are required under the Data Act to produce reports looking at the implementation of the Act. So we most recently did a report that compiled some of the findings from the Inspectors General, the SIGI community, that came out earlier this week. We had done our own report looking at the first quarter of data submitted last year in 2017. And although, as we have heard, there has been great progress, there are still opportunities to continue for continuous improvement. It is to be expected, given the size and breadth of the federal government, that this would be incremental. Mm -hmm. But particularly in terms of completeness, accuracy, and data quality, there are still great strides that remain. And so we remain in touch on a couple of in a couple of ways with OMB and Treasury, looking at data governance, following up on the Section Five pilot that we heard about. Well, um, it was also mentioned by Mr. Hollister about what the law requires. And the law requires that all agencies report on their improper payments. And we know that, uh, uh, and that includes the federal programs, and there were 18 programs that did not report, including managed care for Medicaid, which uh, I think uh, could be a significant uh, addition to the, uh, to the improper payments from last year. It was $141 billion, 36.3 of which was, was uh, the non-managed care part of, of, of Medicaid. In regard to grants, uh, programs. Uh, the uh, uh, I think uh, Mr. Raskin mentioned 15 percent. Historically, what ha what has that that rate been, and uh, and and how well are we monitoring the improper payments on on that end? And and there is you know that includes fraudulent grants. Right. Improper payments is something I know you have heard from our Comptroller General. Uh, he cares deeply about it, and for good reason. We spend billions of dollars on federal programs, and you have appropriated them for a reason to serve something you consider a public good. And so it is something that we continue to plan to follow. It is, uh, in many cases, waste, fraud, or abuse. And so we, of course, look forward to continuing that work for this committee. If there are particular areas that we have not already looked at but you are interested in, we would certainly be happy to talk with you and your staff and determine how we could do that going forward. Well, it's an area that I'm very focused on right now. But uh, one of the, th again, the thing that I want to try to get to is, is, is to figure out a way not only to reduce improper payments, to, but to get the federal agencies and federal programs to comply with federal law and their reporting. Uh, with that, I will uh, yield and recognize, uh, again, the ranking member, Mr. Raskins, for additional questions. I have no additional questions, Mr. Chairman, and I just want to thank all the witnesses for their very insightful testimony today. I believe uh, Dr. Fox would like to ask some additional questions, and, and so I'm happy to recognize her. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I um, will as you have follow up a little bit on um, on the issues you were talking about. And I will say um, to Ms. Sager, I'm a big fan of the GAO also, and uh, my middle initial is A, and I, I've got you one better, <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. I tell everybody it stands for accountability. It used to stand for Ann, but <laughs> since I came to Washington, it stands for accountability because I think that's all I talk about. Um, we all know that trying to change any organization is difficult. I don't care if it's a big organization or small organization. But do you guys, and Ms. Sager in particular, do you have any particular insights into why this grant reform that we are attempting to do has presented such a long-standing challenge? Any insights into that? 
a couple of things that I would mention, and it was interesting preparing for this hearing to look back at some of GAO's work literally spanning decades. The challenges that I mentioned, streamlining, transparency, et cetera, they are truly longstanding challenges. We've had a number of these reform initiatives that we've heard about today. And in spite of that, across administrations, across people implementing these programs, these challenges remain for a lot of the reasons that you've already cited. The federal government is a huge entity spending hundreds of billions of dollars and we are the nature of a democracy. We do have transitions from one administration to the next, so you do have constant churn. At the same time, one of the things certainly that we have seen is this incremental progress. So as these reform initiatives have occurred, we have been able to see progress. In addition, certainly we're in an age where we have technological capabilities that we certainly didn't have a decade ago or two decades ago. So now we have this tremendous opportunity to take these reform initiatives in a new direction, not just for some of the standard grants management issues that we've talked about, but then also to tie it to some of the other initiatives that are happening that I mentioned in my statement. So we're really, really looking at value for money and looking at outcomes as we have some of the evidence base that we understand whether or not we're actually achieving the goals that are in the legislation and the purpose statements to tie that with the budget and performance information so that we can look more holistically and you can then be better positioned to have decision making that is based on facts. And Dr. Fox, if I may, sure. it's also true, uh, uh, Ms. Saker points out technological capabilities. Nobody has ever tried to do what you are trying to do and that is separate the data itself from the forms and the filings that right now contain it. And, and to add one thing, Dr. Fox, the other aspect of this is the great opportunity here for seeing bipartisan efforts by this committee and this Congress to move forward. Every example of reform that we've talked about has been bipartisan, and I think that's one of the powers we could see. Well, as I said before, this, is, this is t should be totally bipartisan. I mean, we may disagree on policy, but once legislation is passed, it's going to be implemented. And the thing we all ought to care about is making sure that the money is being spent the way people said it was going to be spent and that you get results. I mean, again, I, there are a lot of programs around here I'd love to get rid of. I know I'm not going to be able to do that. So the best thing to do is to put in systems so you get so everybody can see, is that money being spent the way it should? Are you getting results? Are we helping people in the way that we said we were going to help people? That's my motivation right now. And I think everybody should want to do that and say, money's scarce. I mean, there's never enough of it here. And so everybody should want to know what how to get the best out of it. We just had an innovation forum in the education committee a few minutes ago, a little while this morning, and um, amazing kinds of things going on to, to share about what's happening, how much better things are going in some places in terms of education workforce development. And the whole idea, again, was to get this information out to people so other people could replicate it. Mm -hmm. And that's, again, the whole idea. But I am encouraged. I'm very encouraged by a lot of the things that have been said today. So I thank you and I thank the chairman for his indulgence um, in allowing me to ask additional questions. Okay, I have just a, a, a couple other things that I, I wanna bring up. Um, Mr. Tyler, in your, your testimony, you also talked about what the, the administration's trying to do and that uh, the final and most important data standardization goal lacks specificity. Uh, uh, and this is for any any of you. Uh, have any of you taken a look at, at what the administration tried to do and offered any recommendations for for uh, to close that gap to, or, or, or to get the specificity that we need? And I'll start with you, Mr. Tyler. Sure, and it, this is very straightforward. It may sound like common sense, but because that plan, and this is the only public plan that we have access to, simply had to be determined in many, many locations, especially in the out years, we really have no understanding at all. So very straightforward, I think it would be a good question for the administration, when will we have more specificity? When will we have milestones? Um, does the, the GRADE Act uh, help provide some of that? 
I, I think one of the key things of the GREAT Act, and, and I say this in respect for the legislation, probably the administration and the agencies can do, uh, have the full authority to do that if they wanted to. What I think the GREAT Act does, like a lot of legislation, including the GONE Act, is put the stamp of importance from Congress mm -hmm. to say, let's get this done, as well as making sure that there's timelines and reporting back to Congress on a regular basis. That is key. Um, Ms. Keegan, uh, you were talking about the, the divisions between uh, the federal grant departments and the debate databases contribute to uh, issues for, for reporting and compliance, and I just want to I just had this thought, and you can respond to it. But but when you 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 mentioned grant management, and and I and I wrote a note define grant management because what I'm thinking our our, our grant management workforce I think is exact is what you said is if you're talking about uh, grant management workforce, it seems to me, and again I, I ran a think tank for 24 years. Prior to that, I worked for two engineering companies. Uh, it seems to me that those who approve the grants, who do the evaluations and, and approve them, should also be the ones who evaluate them. And um, we're, we're talking about a, a, a single portal, uh, eliminating the various silos. Um, I'd like for you to, to give me an explanation of what you meant by uh, a grant management workforce. So one of the challenges with having siloed grant management functions is that each function has different training needs. So if you're dealing with financial information and uh, financial dispersing grant awards, um, you're going to train the CFO program people differently than you would if you're dealing with grant program experts who are running, say, a FEMA hazard mitigation grant program who need um, much more training on specific regulations for those programs. You mentioned the, the question about uh, whether or not the folks that approve the grants would also be the folks that would evaluate the grants. The short answer is it depends on what you mean by evaluate. The program um, workforce, the grant program specialists, are the ones that, that run the review panels to review applications and to make awards. Those people are also the ones that manage the grants. So theoretically, it would be the same workforce that would approve a grant that would then evaluate whether or not the grantee had met any kind of performance matrix that was required or whether the grantee was in compliance with the regulations for the, the grant program. Now, you might have the other shops, like the financial um, uh, shop, review things like, was the audit completed correctly? Was the audit submitted to the Federal Audit Clearinghouse, et cetera? And the uh, IG might get involved if there was some allegation of waste, fraud, and abuse by the grantee. But the grant program people do definitely um, have a, a key role in approving and then also evaluating that. So if you were to look at developing training uh, requirements, you could theoretically break it up where here's the training requirements for financial grant management, here's training requirements for program grant management. But here's the thing. We have the federal acquisition regulations for, for procuring goods and services. And, you know, we, we'll put out specifications for what we need to buy, and then supposedly we buy what we specify. And maybe this is a little simplistic, but I would think that we should be doing something similar to that on, on grants, that if someone submits a grant request uh, and, and they define the objective and the timeline, then there ought, there, uh, there ought to be a way, uh, and, and, it ought, and I tend to think it should be the same people that then uh, follow up on that to make sure that the objective was achieved and within the time frame. Um, uh, I, I would literally go so far on some of the really big grants that, that we sent out the money uh, um, similar to what you would do on, on an um, engineering contract. If we had a $500 million facility we were going to build, we would get so much on the design phase, so much, uh, you know, breaking ground and, and, you know, the construction phase and, and you know, 50% complete, 75% complete, and then after final inspection you get the, the balance of the pavement. What I've found is we don't do that a lot. And uh, consequently, um, uh, w We've created a, a, a huge uh, a problem uh, on, on the spending side. And I guess the thing, and, and again, going back with my meetings with GAO and, 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 and the Inspect, uh, General Dodero, is that uh, every dollar that we spend right now on this stuff uh, that goes out improperly or, or is mismanaged is a, a, a dollar we have to borrow. 
uh, we're projecting deficits next year of a trillion dollars. So every grant dollar, if it's $700 billion, every grant dollar is a borrowed dollar that we're paying interest on. So I think we owe it to the taxpayers, we owe it to the American public, and we owe it to our own future to make sure that, that we maximize uh, whatever spending that, that, that we approve and we get what we're paying for and that we eliminate as much as possible as we're trying to do on the improper payments so that uh, we can uh, get better control of this. Um, I, I, I'm, I think I'm going to conclude with that. I don't want to weary the witnesses. You've given excellent testimony. I appreciate uh, you being here. Uh, it's insightful and helpful. So um, unless um, uh, uh, the hearing record will remain open for two weeks for any member to submit a written opening statement or, or questions for the record, if there's no further business without objection. The subcommittee stands adjourned. Get the I ran the library. <laughs> 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 <laughs>